When you let God lead you, things will change in your life for good, no matter how crazy it seems. Someone once said, God never calls you to leave you. He calls you to lead you. And another said, let us think twice about what we do. Let God lead us even if our flesh says otherwise. You need to stand strong because now is the time. Dear believer, one of the most common things you will experience as you draw closer and closer to your miracle is that when God begins to train you to follow his guidance, your flesh will try to say otherwise. Our flesh is our greatest adversary because it is with us from birth until we die. It is not the skin that covers your bones, no. The term flesh refers to our default nature, those characteristics we are born with. The Bible calls it the old man. It also tells us that as long as we live, there will always be a battle between your spirit, the real you that is born again and has God's eternal life, versus the flesh, the old nature of sin that used to dominate your life and keep you against God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are watching this video and have been struggling with your flesh over things you know God wants you to do, or you have been feeling like you are not good enough or something is wrong with you, be encouraged. God's Word says that there is a conflict that is constantly ongoing in the life of everyone on earth. What makes the difference between children of God and children of the world is that children of God can hear and be led by the Spirit of God, something that children of this world cannot do. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 4 through 5? He said, When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The children of the world do not struggle with hearing God. In fact, they enjoy being led by the flesh the devil's instrument to enslave people in their sins. You see, Satan does not force people to sin, just as he didn't force Eve to eat the fruit. Instead, he deceives people by making sin and death look appealing. This is why people find entertainment in things that kill them little by little. They find pleasure in a life that chokes the life out of them. But when we let Jesus lead us out of this life by surrendering our lives to him, he gives us the ability to hear and follow Him. That's what that verse is saying. The believer will struggle to follow another voice. Their only peace will be knowing they have heard the voice of the Good Shepherd, Jesus, and are following Him. And you don't have to worry about how it will turn out when God leads you. Do you know why? Jesus said that He walks ahead of His flock when He leads them. This means that you will never walk alone. He will be in front of you, and He will help you. Doesn't this encourage you? Are you at a place where you are struggling to hear God's voice right now and don't know what to do? As a child of God, the easiest way to know that the Lord is leading you is to be close to His Word. If you do not know God's Word for yourself and haven't understood who He is, the devil may easily lead you astray deceiving you that you are being led by God. Let us take a look at our Lord Jesus. He is the Word of God personified. Yet, the devil tried to use the Word of God to deceive him. For example, Satan quoted the Bible when he told Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. But thank God that Jesus knew the Word. Thank God that He was the Word. And thank God that Jesus had a proper understanding of God. He knew that God could not contradict himself. God cannot tell you to jump to your death so that he can prove that he will save you. God will not ask you to get yourself into trouble to prove to the world that he delivers. Does he deliver people from trouble? Yes, he does. Does he save people from death and destruction? Yes. But God does not throw people into trouble or ask people to tempt him. James, the apostle, wrote in James chapter 1, verse 13, 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. Maybe you are thinking, but didn't God tempt Abraham? No, God didn't. There is a difference between a test and a temptation. A test comes to confirm your current level in order to promote you to the next level. Tests often come with blessings. Tests, or as we may also know them, trials, come from God and are meant to strengthen us further. Temptations, on the other hand, come from the devil. They are not meant to promote you, but to bring you down. The purpose of that temptation in your life is not to lead you toward God, but away from Him. Do you think that could be coming from God? You got it right. It is coming from the devil. The devil wants you defeated, but God wants you promoted. The devil wants you down, but God wants you above. Now, here is where it gets interesting. When you let God lead you, no matter how challenging the terrain is, each step will bring you closer to your best life, the life ordained for your glory. Maybe you have been praying for a change of story, a better job, a good partner, capital to start a business, strength to overcome a sinful habit, or whatever it may be. Listen, when you let God lead you, you can watch how your life changes. It will be like a dream. Just as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 126 verse 1, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. When God leads you, you don't have to understand. You don't have to figure out how it is going to work. That's His job. Your job is to step out in faith. I have watched God change things in my life every time I let Him lead. I had days when I insisted on sitting in the driver's seat. I had days when I felt I knew what I wanted for my life. I had days when it seemed like what God was saying wasn't right, too complicated, and made no sense. This only led me to more and more frustration. I hated myself. My wins were short-lived. Many things I found assurance with fell apart right before my eyes until I returned to God. You too can come back to God today, my friend. It doesn't matter how far you have gone. If you will confess your error and admit that you need Him, the Bible says that God is faithful to come to your aid. He won't abandon those who consider Him their shepherd. You may have made some decisions that changed the course of your life and affected those around you. Do you know that if you let God lead you, He can bring beauty out of those ashes? Isaiah chapter 61 verses 3 through 4 says, And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. This is what happens when God begins to change your life. But how will God change your life if you still struggle to let Him lead you? God's Word says that children of God are those who God's Spirit can lead. So, let me ask you again. Are you letting God lead you? Is God behind the decision you are about to make or the one you have already made? As I said earlier, the most common way God leads His children is by His Word. The Bible may not literally tell you, go apply for that position in that organization. However, when you submit yourself to the Word and meditate on it often, the Holy Spirit can use it to illuminate your heart in that area and give you peace. For example, you may be praying and asking the Lord for prosperity in business as a confirmation that it is the business He wants you to do. The Holy Spirit may or may not speak literally that you should be in that particular business and you'll prosper. He may instead impress the Word in your heart while you pray. As you pray, you may be led to read in a place like Job chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, where it says, For you will have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the wild animals will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. The verse may become your revealed scripture for your job or business. 
It is God telling you that although the terrain looks rough and challenging, you will prosper. Where others struggle, you will enjoy favor and thrive in your work. Hence, whether you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, stumble on a verse, receive a word from someone, or perhaps receive a vision from God, each must have its root in what God's Word says. You must run away from anything that does not agree with what the Word says. Anything that tries to lead you outside the Word of God will lead you outside His will and eventually result in destruction. But when you let God lead you, your battles become His battles. Whatever opposes you stands against Him. Whatever challenges you will answer to Him. And you know what happens when things stand against God. They will be shattered to pieces. It is time for us to start returning to a life completely surrendered to God. It is time for us to begin yielding ourselves to His guidance. It won't be easy. He never said it would be. But as we continue to trust Him each step of the way, the Red Sea in front of us will part and the enemies behind us will be overthrown. This is God's word to you today, and I pray it will make a turnaround in your life forever. Have you ever wondered how animals in the wild live and eat each day? Yes, they have their natural survival instincts, but have you ever stopped to consider how they deal with life without taxes, a salary, a job, and the other things that worry us every day? But here is the only reasonable answer. God cares for them. Call it nature. Call it a coincidence that they just stumble upon their food somehow, or they just recover from sickness without world-class health facilities like ours. Call it whatever you want. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a God above who watches over His creation and takes care of them. And when you trust Him with your needs, you can be assured that He will make everything beautiful for you. Stop worrying, dear believer. It is natural and even healthy to worry about what might happen in the future. However, when that worry becomes exhausting, it turns into anxiety that affects our day-to-day -day lives. Hear the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? According to the Bible, what is behind our endless worry? Simply the result of uncertainty. And the Bible teaches that uncertainty is, essentially, a distrust of God's plan. Jesus added in Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through 34, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will He not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Anxiety is experiencing fear and worries that you wouldn't experience if you trusted God. My goal is to tell you that there is still hope. How? Why? Because God is with you and for you. The only thing is to trust Him. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-6 through six says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. And when you trust in Him, you can rise up in God's strength and face your fears head on, overcoming and triumphing over them. I need you to pause and ask yourself, why do I worry? Is my anxiety changing anything for the better or just killing me little by little? Is there any spiritual need you can solve with your physical strength? Can we solve all of life's problems simply by our human understanding or actions? Think about this for a moment. At this stage in human history, we would know if this were possible, right? The truth is that there isn't any human solution to life's daily crises. No amount of money, connections, influence, or intelligence on earth that can meet all your needs. 
God remains the source now and forever. And without His help, we are helpless and hopeless in this life. And today, He is sending you this message. Here is what God wants you to do instead of crying, worrying about what isn't working, or the unending battles in your life. Jesus wants you to have faith. The Lord simply asks you to put your faith in Him. Our faith brings God into our situations. And when God is present in your situation, He will handle it and give you peace. The Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and it describes what happens to those who trust the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. What would you say if I asked if you had faith? You'd say, yes, wouldn't you? That's an easy thing to say. But the truth is that very few of us have faith when it truly matters. And the Bible tells us the danger of not walking by faith. It says that no one can please God without faith. Your faith is what draws God's attention to you. The Bible says God's plan is good. He wants to give you a future and a hope. Why worry about what the world throws at you? Saints, don't look at your present circumstances. Take your eyes off it. Instead, turn towards the Lord Jesus. Since He gave His life for you, don't you think He can save you from whatever is causing endless tears? Since Jesus rose again on the third day after laying down His life, since He could raise Lazarus from the dead after the young man was buried for four days, don't you think your case is not as hopeless as you believe it is? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This means that He can give life to something that is dying. And even if it eventually dies, He can give it a restoring life, reviving it and rescuing it from the grip of death. What is representing death in your life right now? Can you place it before Jesus and let it fade, paling compared to the brightness of the glory of the one who overcame death and the grave? There is nothing He cannot fix when we entrust it to Him. Allow Christ to prove this in your life, dear saint. Trust Him. Have faith that He can solve those things for you and watch Him fix them individually. Don't forget that the Lord Jesus lives in you if you are born again. He knows and sees each of us. He understands each one of us personally. He knows our strengths, weaknesses, hopes, and fears. He is our loving Father, patient, compassionate, and understanding. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 says, because He Himself suffered when He was tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. He is able. Take note of those words. He is able to do, to heal, and to help. Will you trust in the saving Lord today? God is a God of possibility. Worrying does not change God's plan for your life, but can limit your experience of it. Have faith and trust the Lord with that need. Jesus can make the impossible possible. The Lord also wants you to stand on His Word. You need to understand that life is unpredictable. Things happen, both positive and negative. What matters is not whether they happen or not, but how you deal with them. Negativity brings worry when you accept it, weakening your faith and dependence on God. However, accepting God's truth about you and your situation, especially according to what His Word says, creates a positive mindset placing you above the unfavorable situation and positioning you for an experience more significant than your expectations. Let me ask you this. How much of God's Word do you know concerning the situation that is worrying you? You know that we often watch movies or YouTube videos that encourage our worry. They try to tell us that it's an excellent place to be because you can draw sympathy and find help. However, this is not true. Many people may sympathize with you, but very few will help you. Some of us deeply research our predicaments. We know the correct terminologies of what is destroying us, but we know little about the basic things that can give us life. This video is not to judge you, but to encourage you to turn in the right direction. The Bible says that heaven and earth may pass away, but the Word remains. It adds that this Word is a living and powerful force to reckon with. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, 
joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You need to sit down with God's Word, spend time with it, and know what it says about you and your pain and need. Then stand on it. Take God by His Word and walk like you believe that God cannot fail. This is why the Bible says faith comes through the Word. For instance, concerning your health, it says that you have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Concerning your needs, it says that He will supply all according to His riches in glory. There is no limit to God's wealth. He can never go bankrupt. Never. Concerning your academics, He says you can receive so much of His wisdom that you become more insightful than your teachers. If there is a storm, Jesus says He is your calm. It might be tiring to feel intense pressure, but fix your gaze on your helper. He is right there with you and will never fail you. God's Word enlightens your life and assures you that He is your Creator and never changes. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as you gaze on Him, He wants you to do one more thing. Pray. There is a confidence that comes upon you when you pray. When you pray in faith, standing on God's Word concerning your need. The miracle process begins for you, and the growth process begins within you. Joy and assurance well up deep within your heart. You wake up every day like you have everything you need. You are not afraid to declare that God is changing things for you. Not because you can see anything with your physical eyes, but because time spent in prayer has consumed all your fears and replaced them with faith and confidence in the Lord. People who pray believe and sense that God is always with them and that they will certainly overcome whatever the devil throws at them. I remember telling someone that one of the best ways to deal with mental health issues is by praying to God and pouring out your heart to Him. When you pour out your heart to the Lord in prayer, He responds by overwhelming you with a more profound sense of His love and peace. The Bible says to cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. And how do you do this? Through prayer. When you pray, you are letting go of your worries and allowing God to take care of them. Prayer builds our relationship with God. It helps you know God's nature better and better. Prayer builds your faith. Prayer opens you up to receive God's peace. Prayer births miracles. Never allow any worry to kill your zeal for prayer. Pray without ceasing. Pray when you feel like it and pray when you don't feel like it. Pray on your best days and pray on your worst days. But no matter what, don't stop praying. A preacher once said, If there is a man to pray, then there is a God to answer. Jesus is ready to fix that problem. He wants you to transfer everything to Him in faith and let Him carry that burden for you. Trust Him and watch Him fix what has been broken. According to recent research, it was found that morning people have more positive moods. They're more determined, agreeable, conscientious, proactive, cooperative, and persistent and are better planners. This shows that even science agrees that it's vital for the mind to be engaged early in the morning. But let me ask, if the mornings are so great, why aren't we all up early? Why is getting out of bed sometimes so difficult and pointless? This is a great one to ponder because it affects our lives in one way or another. Dear child of God, as you listen to this video, I want you to know that it's a great privilege that we can seek God. The Almighty God gives us the ability to seek Him. In His mercy, He eagerly awaits to reveal Himself to everyone who genuinely comes to Him. David, Nehemiah, Esther, and many other people written of in the Bible genuinely sought the Lord for direction, and He answered them on several occasions. He was there to guide them with clear directions and instructions in the areas of need in their lives. The Lord Jesus Himself gave us this encouragement in the Scripture to encourage us to seek God for everything we do every day. Matthew 7, 7 Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
David also wrote in Psalm 5.3, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Here, David tells us that it was his habit to seek God in the morning hours to make the rest of the day meaningful. He first presented himself to the Lord before facing the day's challenges. He always saw the need to appear and worship God before appearing to men. This made David a man God found great delight in. King David, a warrior, priest, psalmist, father, and husband, said this about seeking the Lord. Psalm 63.1 O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Jesus showed the disciples the same pattern of engaging oneself with God early in the morning by practicing it himself. The Bible tells us that early in the morning, before everyone woke up, Jesus would be up and out in the mountain praying to God. It's no surprise that we read about supernatural results which followed his earthly ministry. It's traceable to that one habit of seeking the Lord early. When the children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon, God spoke to them by the mouth of his servant, Jeremiah. And what do you think God told them? Usually, you'd see that God would automatically move on their behalf to save them or perhaps give them a promise of a coming deliverance, right? However, that's not what God did. Instead, he told them to seek him in that land of captivity. We can use the captivity of the Israelites as an analogy for life's uncertainties, mistakes, rejections, disappointments, frustrations, confusions, or anything else that seems to keep your life in a difficult situation. For God is telling you the same thing he told the Israelites in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and will come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When we genuinely seek the Lord with all our hearts, God has promised that he will answer us and meet us where we need him. You see, the condition of our hearts is critical in seeking God, and He promises that He will surely reward those that seek Him earnestly. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.6, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Let me quickly share three things that will stir up your heart to always seek the Lord. One an earnest longing for fellowship with God. An honest desire for fellowship will draw you closer to God. It'll make you always seek Him first and foremost. David attested to this when he said that his meditations in the night were about God's loving kindness, glory, and power, and how God helped him. Such meditations made David enjoy being in God's presence, fellowshipping with Him. Each moment in God's presence allowed David to pour himself out before the Lord. But here's something interesting too. Each of these moments also gave God the opportunity to pour grace, glory, anointing, and wisdom on David to function in all his capacities. Beloved, when you develop a longing for intimate relationship with God, you'll find it difficult not to make God your first priority every day. And just like David never lost a battle because he always sought God and put him first, you will always have victory, no matter what life throws at you. 2. Having complete dependence on God Another thing that will continuously stir you to seek God early in your day and throughout your life is the ability to maintain steady and complete dependence on Him. The world today is full of voices constantly speaking to us leaving us confused over what to listen to and what not to listen to, what's right and what's wrong, what to believe and what not to believe. The danger in paying attention to all these random voices and opinions is that they'll only overwhelm us with confusion, frustration, and a myriad of doubts, leaving us helpless and hopelessly lost. 
Therefore, to escape the chaos into God's blessings of peace and to gain direction for each day by the wisdom that only God can give, it's crucial that we pay attention to seeking Him early in the morning. This is one of David's secrets. He says in Psalm 143:8, Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Don't just wake up and jump out of bed. Don't just get up and face the day. The days are evil, and to overcome the enemy, you need the strength and grace of God in your life. 3. Honoring the Lord Some schools of thought believe that when God commanded us to not have any other gods besides Him, He meant that in everything we do, He must come first. It's a sign of honor, love, and respect when you put someone first. If you have regard for someone, you'll consider them before you make decisions in your life. Why? Because they'll be affected by your decision, directly or indirectly, whether you succeed or fail. Similarly, when we greatly regard God and want to honor Him, we'll always put Him first in everything we do. We won't want to begin our day without Him. And we wouldn't want to make any critical decision without letting Him know that we need His wisdom and grace to succeed. God must come first in our resources, in our time, in our relationships, and in our decisions. Putting God first in the morning is another way of saying God is a priority in your life and that you acknowledge Him as the source of life. Thus, you want to honor Him by seeking Him early. God's Word tells us that a man's heart invents his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. God is all-knowing. He already knows what will bring you good. If He didn't withhold Jesus from you, my friend, He will not withhold any other good thing from you. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows where your life's journey begins and knows full well when it'll end. Matthew 6, 33 But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. As believers, I encourage you to make seeking God and His kingdom your primary pursuit. Any other thing we pursue is inferior. And what's the result? The Lord says, all these things shall also be given to you. What did Jesus mean when he said all these things? This means you'll have things others seek, including those things you don't even know you need. Today, many people in their search for money, a good job, a good marriage partner, and material possessions have put God on hold. But God promises his blessings will follow those who put him first in all their endeavors. Isn't this just awesome? The current global unemployment rate based on 101 countries was 7.12%. Also, the numbers of unemployed people worldwide continues to increase by the day. According to the World Bank, about 719 million people live in extreme poverty. This information should explain why so many people are busy trying to make a living today. However, many end up pursuing the things Jesus promises will follow those who seek His kingdom and His righteousness. One primary recipe for frustration, confusion, lack, and fear is living a life that puts the cart before the horse. This means that we make everything else a priority except God. If God's first in our hearts, we will also consciously engage Him every morning for direction resulting in a life of blessing and power. Who better to take the lead than our faith's author and finisher, who knows the end from the beginning? Seeking God is a lifestyle that can be learned, developed, and mastered until it becomes a rewarding practice. Its rewards far exceed material blessings. Rich, ever-flowing confidence exudes from His presence as we fellowship and draw strength, wisdom, direction, and hope for the day ahead. These are the real blessings that only the children of God can have. According to Psalm 1, 1 1-3, when God is first, He promises He will make you like a tree planted by streams of water. You will live a life continuously refreshed by His presence and always abounding in His grace. He promises that you will yield fruit in your season. 
This means God will supply you with the strength and vigor that enables you to produce fruit in all areas of your life. He says that whatever you do will prosper. You will become prosperous in all you do, regardless of the opposition around you. Imagine a daily life that attracts God's blessings, enjoying favor everywhere you go. Who are these blessings for? Are they for everyone? No. This experience is exclusively reserved for believers who have genuinely opened up to have Jesus lead the way in their lives. If we genuinely seek the Lord in prayer, He promises to hear us. His arms are always wide open. He is always willing to show Himself to those who come to Him for direction, rest, and comfort. We are living in the last days. In fact, we've probably been in this period for years. Most people are in denial about this because all they can think about is the end of the world and Christ's return. Although it really is about that, we tend to overlook the fact that we have a certain set of responsibilities to fulfill at this time. The word last does not mean that the end is in a few months or years. It simply means that we're living in the indefinite number of days God has allotted before His day of judgment. The problem is that humans see this as a glass half empty type of thing. We anticipate the end more than the time we have left to carry out the instructions God has given us. We focus more on the reward of standing before Christ than His instructions on how to live in these last days. It's focusing only on the destination and not paying attention to the journey it takes to get there. Matthew 24 43 through 44 says, But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We pour all our energy into getting ready, which involves asking for repentance and performing good acts. However, there is more to God's return than just these two things. As followers, our role today is more pressing than ever. We are not called to relax just because God is about to fetch us. We are tasked to do the opposite. As you finish this message, you will know how our Father really wants us to live in these last days. Let's get on with it. Firstly, live these days in anticipation and glee. 1 John 3, 2 reads, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. Imagine seeing the Most High God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the One who made all things beautiful, the Father who sustained you and fought all your battles with you, Tell me, is there anything else more important and exciting than this? 1 Peter 1, 5 states, And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. My brothers and sisters, the day where your faith is rewarded is nearing. Your obedience, hard work, and resilience as a follower are seen, and He is about to fulfill His promise of eternal life. We've been looking forward to the day of judgment since the day we were baptized. I'm telling you, this is our time to shine. Psalm 37, 29 also says that, The righteous will possess the earth, and they will live forever on it. Admittedly, we can never achieve full righteousness, but the important part is that we try every day. We devote ourselves to being better followers than yesterday, don't we? Have you ever seen how a dog behaves whenever its owner comes home? Their level of excitement is truly unmatched. They can't stay still. Their tails wag like crazy, and they usually cry out in glee. This is because one of their sources of happiness is being in the company of their owner, who loves and cares for them deeply. Dogs are very social creatures. When their owners aren't around, all they do is wait for them to come back. 
We should learn to be as excited as them for our creator is coming back too. And for us, we are set to live in God's presence very soon. If fear conquers you rather than excitement, it speaks a lot about your lack of confidence in the sanctification God has given to you. It suggests that you're not ready to let go of the material things here on earth for eternal life. Do not let Satan's influence destroy you at the last minute. I want to take this moment to remind you that God's return is our end game. It's our finish line here on earth right before we live a new life in God's kingdom. So let us gleefully await the Most High. Next, he wants us to strengthen our grip on the gospel of Christ. In Mark 13, 10, God explicitly instructs us with this, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Just because Jesus is coming doesn't mean that the fight is over. In these last days, the Lord wants us to strengthen our commitment to heeding and sharing the gospel. One of the primary reasons can be found in 2 Peter 3.3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. The forces of evil will put up a fight and double their efforts to influence more people, knowing how the devil greatly competes with God. We should take note that he will work harder, especially now that Judgment Day is coming. The enemy wants to displease the Lord by showing him that his people do not revere him. It's our obligation as representatives of God to combat such wicked plans, and we do this by seeking his kingdom further. I'm sure you're aware that we are currently living in a very challenging reality. There are crimes and disasters left and right. Wars are not resolved and disobedience often goes unpunished. This is the harsh truth. The world is fading away. And for this reason, we must work harder to spread the gospel so that our loved ones won't fade with the world too. The word of God is unchanging. It is the only thing that can help prepare humanity for his arrival. As said by Joyce Meyer, the rapture is the ultimate expression of God's love for his people. Before we finally experience this, the people need to know that there is something glorious waiting for them. They need to know that the rapture is not the end, but rather the beginning of all things new and pleasing. Believe it or not, we are entitled to act as shepherds. Our grasp of God's commands makes us qualified to guide our neighbors to the way to eternal life. When a president visits a foreign country, do you think the authorities of the latter sit nonchalantly and just go with the flow? They do everything they can to accommodate the president in the best way possible. They obtain information on the president's interests, hobbies, allergies, preferences, and everything else that they can dig up just to make sure that the visit will be very pleasant. In the same way, as we wait for the Lord's return, we are also encouraged to further broaden our knowledge and feed our spiritual selves. We strive to learn more about him and his words so that when the time comes, we are fully prepared and knowledgeable about what can happen. There is no fear when you know you're ready. To sum it up, we need to hold on to the Word of God more strongly than ever in order to fight the evil forces and show how loyal we are to our Father until the end of time. The last piece of advice is to achieve a united front with the church and the people. God returns to everyone who believes in him and accepts him as their savior, not only to those who did it first. I'm going to be honest here. Some Christians tend to be selfish and self-righteous. There is a notion that because they've been serving the Lord for a long time, they don't really need to care about non-believers anymore. They might think, well, that's their choice and they're about to get what they deserve. They are convinced that the end is near, and so they drop their responsibilities as a disciple and think, I've done my part, goodbye. Let us recall Jesus' crucifixion. Remember the thief on the cross? That thief asked for repentance even though it seemed too late. He was so close to death, already crucified, and the whole nation knew him for his sins. 
he repented. And Jesus told him not to worry, for he had earned a place in paradise. I want you to really think about God's love here. Salvation is not on a first come first serve basis. When Christians gloat and delight in the idea that they already have a spot in heaven, we need to think more about those who haven't turned their backs on the world yet. It's not our task to judge who is worthy of eternal life and who isn't. But it is our job to make sure that everyone is well informed about our Father's generosity. Everyone needs to know that they still have a chance to repent and that there's no shame in doing so. The fight isn't over until God declares it so. Having said this, we need to be more dedicated to spreading the gospel. We have to work towards unity and encourage each other. Christians are not. Aside from this, unity will be essential as we live in an environment where evil forces seem to dominate. Critical times hard to deal with will be here. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, disobedient to parents, without self-control, fierce, without love of goodness, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The rapture will inevitably cause panic among a lot of people, Christians included, as part of being united in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, we are asked to therefore encourage one another with these words. Amidst the chaos and fear, we have to share the peace God has put in our hearts. These are three pieces of advice on living in the last days derived from God's word. Are you incorporating all of these into your daily life? Let's make an effort to do so, and I assure you that your effort will not go unseen. Check in with your brothers and sisters in Christ and assess how they feel about the rapture and the fact that we are living in the end times. Share what you know, seek what you have yet to learn and maintain a hopeful and excited spirit. The Lord will be pleased to know that you're carrying out your responsibilities diligently. Together, we look forward to the day our Father Almighty fulfills his promise of eternal life to his children. This is a message from the Spirit of God to you, dear saint. I don't know you, but he does. As I thought about a special message for you, the words I heard within my heart were, so many people are suffering from identity crises. This is such a profound statement in the world today. It is an experience affecting both believers in the body of Christ, which is the church, and unbelievers in the world. One day, as the time for Jesus to ascend into heaven drew near, the Bible tells us about a strange incident that occurred, one the Holy Spirit placed in my heart as we made this video. This event is recorded in Luke 9, 51 to 56. Please stay with me as the Holy Spirit uses this to speak to your heart. Now when the time was approaching for him to be taken up to heaven, he was determined to go to Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose. He sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went into a Samaritan village to make arrangements for him. But the people would not welcome him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and destroy them? But he turned and rebuked them, and he said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they journeyed on to another village. Amplified Bible You may have read or heard about this before, and it is very easy to read stories like this in Scripture, enjoy the story, and go on with our business. Perhaps we could pick a point or two about mercy and forgiveness, letting go of offenses, and ideas like that. However, what if I tell you that there is a message on understanding your identity in these verses? Oh yes, that's true. Let me show you. The disciples could not imagine anyone not wanting their beloved master, Jesus. To them, this was absurd, an offense, a persecution of their Lord, a mockery of his benevolence, 
and this was worthy of divine judgment. They referenced Elijah, who called fire down from heaven to consume those who stood against him. But listen, and hear what Jesus told them. This is where our message is. The Bible says that Jesus rebuked them. Jesus told these two disciples, known as the sons of thunder, Hey, friends, you are angry, and you are speaking out of anger. Now, the word rebuke, as used in this verse in Greek, is epitimesin, which means to censure or admonish. However, in Aramaic, the word is ka'a, which is very similar to the Hebrew word ka'a, which means to feel despondent or to grieve in your heart. So, the Aramaic word means to rebuke, just like the Greek, but it also has a verbal expression of despondency. What is despondency? It means a feeling of low spirits from loss of hope or courage. It means dejection. In other words, Jesus did not scold James and John, as the Greek text would suggest, and like many of us think, Jesus actually expressed his inner grief over their reaction. He was laying his heart bare to his disciples to show his love for mankind. Based on the fact that James and John were ready to have the Samaritans eliminated with lightning bolts for rejecting their beloved master. The tragedy is that James and John thought they were being very pious and righteous, following the example of Elijah. However, they were just angry and vengeful. Maybe there is an evil spirit that binds us to our bitterness and anger, making us believe we are being holy and pious when we insult someone or when we allow how we feel to decide who we think we are. Yeah, we can say, oh, maybe I was a little angry here, but I was justified in it. This is just like James and John were justified in their anger and even had scripture to back them up. Yet it still caused Jesus to ka'a, wound his heart. One thing that wounds the heart of the Lord more than anything is when His chosen people embrace an identity different from who He made them to be. In the days of old, this was common with the Israelites, as every time God brought them out of trouble to rest, they always found a way to get back into trouble. Today, the Holy Spirit is asking you the same question. Do you know what kind of spirit you are? The next thing Jesus said tells us about why he asked this question. He said, The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So, whatever tells you that your way is to attack anyone who isn't on your side is not from God. You may be dealing with any type of identity crisis, including a spiritual crisis of faith and identity, because you just can't understand why some things are the way they are. The Holy Spirit is using this message to tell you that, although it is okay to want answers, it breaks the Lord's heart to see you remaining in that struggle instead of embracing the answers He is showing you, especially if you are plainly refusing those answers for something lesser. Sometimes we think we are going to find the answers in the lies the enemy sells to us, but by the time we realize that it's been a lie all along, we have either lost so many things or gone too deep that we can't help ourselves anymore. The Lord is saying, I have called you by name. You are mine. You have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You do not belong to yourself any longer. Jesus died for you. He died your death so that you can live his life. You have been chosen. God's special child, a holy and precious soul, precious to Him. The truth is still here, waiting for you to embrace it. For John and his brother James, their identity crisis at that time was thinking they were God's executioners, sent to dole out justice on any who were against God. But Jesus showed them that they were more and could be more. He was modeling a path for them to become all God designed for them to be. For you, it may not be an issue of finding yourself in anger, but finding yourself in faith. You may really struggle to stand in faith, 
because you are confused about many things. You are hearing many different things from many well-meaning or apparently well-meaning people, and it's caught you in a fix, like, what then is the truth? Well, here's the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Although many people have a lot to say about what God says or doesn't say, there is only one whose words will stand forever, and that is Jesus. The word of God will remain, even after false teachers and false prophecies pass. The word of God has always been, and no matter how people have tried to corrupt it, we have always found ourselves returning in surrender. This is an encouragement to you to return to embracing God's word as truth and embracing yourself as who he says you are. When you made the decision to follow Jesus, or if you are making that decision while listening to this video right now, it was your decision to hand over your old identity to him and to receive his own identity into you. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Listen, who God says you are and everything he says you have in Christ is settled in heaven, awaiting the time of its manifestation. Do not let the things you feel or the things the enemy shows you deceive you to believe a false gospel. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 1, 9 and 10, As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Your call to salvation, to become a child of God, wasn't and isn't a call to please people or follow the crowd. No, it is far more glorious than that. You have been called to a living hope, my friend, just like the Apostle Peter said above. Let the mockers and scornful laugh. Let them persecute you. It wouldn't make any sense if they didn't. Therefore, take strength in knowing that who you are in Christ is worthy enough to be considered a threat by the enemy. You see that many aren't a threat because their lives are serving the enemy's purposes. However, when he attacks your convictions and tries to tell you that you are not who God says you are, it is a sign that you have something he wants to steal. Don't let him. Rebuke him. Remind yourself and hear the Holy Spirit's voice. You have been redeemed, a holy temple unto God. God does not make mistakes. Everything you have experienced has led you to this very point. Don't be hasty to throw in the towel because you experienced a few setbacks here and there. Stand your ground and believe. All things are possible to those who believe. The glory coming is greater than the crises occurring. There is an end and your expectations will be met soon. Don't give in. Stand strong. You are who God says you are. Keep your eyes fixed on Him and never give up. You are about to come into a deeper dimension of glory with God like you have never seen. These are the makings of a true disciple and you are on your way if you stay consistent with embracing the Holy Spirit's way.